How thin is too thin in simplified piano textures? Hey there, LDS music enthusiast. I'm Dr. Doug Pugh, and today we're looking at hymn number 1006 in the newly released selections from the new LDS hymnal. This hymn is called Think a Sacred Song with Words and Music composed by Marlene Summers Merkling in a primary song format. I quite like this little tune. I, I have a few suggestions, mostly in the piano part, to enrich the texture a bit. And these these uh, suggestions are part of the five writing techniques that I will highlight in this primary song in this video today. Let's get started. Technique one, gradualization and patterns in melody writing. Here we are at the beginning of Think a Sacred Song, and I want to just take note of an interesting rhythmic gesture that makes the tune uh, very interesting and have a nice little bit of freshness to it. So <clears throat> if you look at the tune here, starting at the beginning, we have a pattern here of dotted quarter eighth followed by two eighths and then something longer. Then again, dotted quarter, two eighths, uh, dotted quarter eighth, two quarters, longer. Dotted quarter eighth, two quarters, something longer. And it happens again, and it happens again, and it happens again until the very end, where we basically get uh, a bit of a reversal, where we get straight quarters, and then we get that little dotted quarter eighth at the end. So it's a subtle little thing, but it's a nice way to keep the melody interesting. That's the first part of what I want to share in technique number one. Just have a quick little listen to this. So... That rhythm. Ta, 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 ti, ta, 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 ta. Now going on, measure five. difference. So that de da 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 was not what we were expecting. We were expecting another one of these ta 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 ta. But as it's the last phrase, it's a great time to shake it up a little bit, swap some of the rhythmic gestures. And I love how they basically bookend the melody with dotted quarter eighth. Starting the whole piece with dotted quarter eighth, starting every two bar phrase with dotted quarter eighth until the end, and then ending the last two bar phrase before the final hold it, held note with that dotted quarter eighth. Again, subtle little rhythmic thing, but it adds some nice freshness, especially at the very end. Now, let's look a little bit deeper at this melody. I want you to track with me the low notes as we play through it again. I think you'll notice something really interesting. So we start here in the middle. We get our first low note. Second low note. Third low note. Okay, do you see how those low notes are gradually rising? We start with the low C. Tom, tom, tom. Okay, so there's this sense of gradual rising, rising, rising. And then beneath it, we get this before we start the next phrase. Now, <clears throat> this next phrase is a little different. It starts on C. Your heart and mine are open. Now we're kind of going downward with our tracking. We start with these high Cs. And then we emphasize the G and a high C, and then we go down. The G comes up to A, and the C goes down to B flat. So there's a bit of a, a separate trajectory in this one where the first half of the tune uh, has these, this gradual up, up, up of the low note. What we call this is a compound melody relationship where we have higher notes and we have lower notes. The high notes relate to each other. The low notes relate to each other. 
It's not a super intense compound melody like you might see in a Bach violin piece or something with lots of high notes and then a couple low notes and then lots of high notes. That's the kind of instance where it's like two separate instruments playing, but only on one instrument. And we're getting a little bit of that. But the cool thing for your melody writing is that there is a sense of gradualization, that each phrase takes on a bit of a new flavor by having a a keynote step up the scale as compared to the next keynote or down the scale as compared to the next keynote. It's a fun little melody writing technique. Technique two, clothing naked downbeats. Okay, when writing simplified piano parts, it, there's a lot of tricks. There's a lot of challenges when writing these these simplified parts. Of course, it's really important when we're writing primary songs because we don't want to overtax the primary pianist. We don't know what level of study they've had, so it's important to use a the lowest common bass line that we possibly can uh, to help them play it to the best of their ability without losing the full sense of our harmony. Now, something I uh, really look for in these simplified writings with my students is that the downbeat of each measure, even though we're taking out extra notes to simplify it, that the downbeat gives a sense of the chord. Now, this very opening measure, the way it's written, it's just written with an octave F. And we don't really get the full chord until beat three when the left hand comes up to that A. In my way of thinking, it could be done a little bit better. I would recommend putting that A, as you can see here in orange, in the right hand thumb so that we get the third of the chord sounding throughout the measure. Of course, when you do this, you'll need to change the left hand, and my recommendation would be the F quarter note and the orange C dotted half note that I've provided down there. So instead of what we have now, which sounds like this, it would sound like this. Do you hear how that's a little fuller? Because we start with a complete chord, which really helps us. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to use three notes on every downbeat to get a full chord. If you take a look here at the second measure, the second measure starts with a three chord, but it starts with an A and a C, which is the root and the third of the three chord. And that's enough to give us the sense of the fullness of the chord. The root and the third is enough. Look at the third measure. This is kind of an interesting chord. It's a, we have a suspension happening here. So we do get three voices. Then it resolves on the G. And then the next measure, we get a nice full three-voice chord. The next measure, we get a nice three-voice. So we're feeling a full sense of a chord on the downbeat. And then this one especially, we get a full chord on the downbeat. The next one full chord the next one okay so as you, if you're writing a simplified piano part either for solo piano or for a primary song or for an accompaniment to say a child's violin uh, hymn arrangement or something of that nature check your downbeats make sure that your downbeats if you want to have a nice full resonant sound while keeping it simplified check that your downbeat has the full chord And sometimes that's good enough if you just have the root in the left hand and the third of the chord in the right hand. Technique three, avoiding unnecessary doublings. Now, staying on this same topic of simplified piano writing, again, it's it's a tricky one. You know, we want to make sure we get a, a nice, full, beautiful sound in a way that is as simple as possible for the primary pianist. Now, sometimes when doing this, we can happen upon what I call unnecessary doublings. When we're uh, writing any kind of chord, there's often doublings, meaning if it's a G minor chord, you might have a G in the left hand and a G in the right hand. The note is being doubled. Okay, In a simplified piano texture where we often focus on two voices or three voices only, like soprano, alto in the right hand, and one voice of music in the left hand, uh, we want to be extra careful about unnecessary doublings. 
the thicker your piano texture, like you'll see if you have played any music by Brahms or Debussy or composers like that, you often get a much richer five, six, sometimes seven or eight notes at the same time, heavy, heavy doublings. Of course, the heavier the doublings, the more difficult it is for uh, a basic piano player to play. So we want to be very careful of that in uh, our primary songs with our primary pianists. So there are a couple of spots in this song where I think there's some unnecessary doublings that would sound a little bit better if they were slightly rewritten. The first one is here in measure four. So measure four, we're in the key of F major. Now we have a G minor chord, a two chord. Now you'll notice we have the, the, the two chord is G, B flat, D. In the right hand, we have a G and a B flat, and we have our root note down at the bottom, but the piano part has another third there, and it's having to re-strike the whole note that's being held there. That's a little bit confusing for the left hand. Like, oh, do I keep holding the right hand thumb, but I have to re-strike it with the left hand thumb? The notation is just a little bit ambiguous. Plus, we don't need to double the third. Doubling the third is usually our last choice when it comes to major and minor chords. There's a whole bunch of doubling rules, so to speak. Now, there's plenty of times when the third does get doubled, but it's not usually our first choice. And in this particular case, it would be very simple to avoid that by moving the left hand B flat down to a G. <clears throat> What it does is it maintains the richness of the minor chord instead of overbalancing the the jelly center of this jelly G minor donut, which is the B flat. Kind of kind of oversaturates it. So instead of B flat, I'd recommend G. That keeps the G minor nice and balanced. A similar thing happens in the next measure, measure five. So we're on a C7 chord here, which is the dominant. C, G, B flat. When we have a dominant 7 chord, we want to be very careful with our doublings. And one of the notes we like to avoid doubling is the 7th of the chord. In this particular case, the 7th is B flat. C, E, G, B flat. Well, as you can see in the original, the downbeat's good. No problems there. But beat three, we've doubled the seventh. Now, it does go away from the seventh right after, but there's a slightly better way to do this without losing any of the rhythmic interest and keeping the chord nice and round. And that would be what I've written here in the left hand in orange. A quarter note C, a half note G, and then move to the B flat on beat four, so we can accompany the D with a B flat below it. That way we're not doubling the third, the seventh. So here's the original. Do you hear that B flat kind of sticks out? It doesn't need to. When we double the seventh, it's again, oversaturating. Sevenths are like seasoning on top of the main dish. If you over season, Ew, that's all you can taste, and it's, that you lose the sense of the main dish, and it can be too much. So, what I'm recommending here with the C, G, half note, B flat quarter, sounds like this. Do you hear how that da -da accompanies the... That's a little fuller, that's a, that's a more balanced kind of a chord voicing in simplified piano writing. And there's one more of these in measure nine, your heart and mind. So this is similar back to measure one. Um, in this particular case, we're on a one chord. So the chord is F, A, C. We start the measure with all three of those notes, which is great. We want the full chord. And then we are still singing an A on this one because it's in the melody. And A is the third of the chord, F, A, C. So we don't need the A here. In fact, it's oversaturating the third of the chord again 
which is that jelly center, where if there's too much jelly and no donut, all, you might as well just spoon out the jelly from the jar. It should be a an addition to the main cord, not the main event. Okay, that it makes it a little richer. So instead of playing the A in the left hand, I recommend the F, which would sound like this. It also creates that tension with the passing tone, which is very nice. Okay, those are my recommendations for incre improving the simplified piano part. Technique four, inner voice foreshadowing. Now, this is a small detail, but it adds a connective tissue into the accompaniment of this song. As we come to the end of the opening eight bars, you'll see this marked in blue on the word hour, we get a little motion in the inner voices of our piano part. So those last couple of bars of that phrase, starting on and in, sound like this. So while the hour is holding, the alto goes dee da dum. This is called a neighbor group, where they're end, they're going to end up on E, but first we go to the lower neighbor of E, D, and then the upper neighbor of E, which is F, and then it resolves to E. That's a, that, that kind of a shape. The shape is called neighbor group. It's not actually a neighbor group in this case because those notes belong to the G minor 7, but I'm getting technical. That What I'm trying to point out is the motion, the shape of that little motive ta -dee -dum, is highlighting something that's about to come at the very end. As you can see in the next blue selection at the very end, we get a very similar shape. It's in reverse, goes high, low, middle. But it's the, it's the end of each of the two eight-bar phrases that get the same little motivic accompaniment on the inside, which creates a nice little glue between the first half and the second half of the song. So at the end of the song, down here, and you will feel... doesn't come out of nowhere. It came from something similar back in measure eight. So the point is finding little ways to connect similar shapes, similar motives throughout the inner voices of your piano writing can add continuity to your music in a very nice way. Technique five, clarifying semi-cluttered chord changes. All right, here we are at the end of the song, and there's just a bit of clutter happening here in the piano part, which I'd like to recommend a suggestion for. Now, to begin with, in this uh, measure where we have, and you will feel, we have a slight uh, composer nerd problem where we have the B flat of the right hand of the melody and the B flat of the left hand going to G and G, on consecutive strong beats. This is what we call parallel octaves. Now this one is not particularly egregious, so you may think I'm being over the top here. Perhaps I am. If you wanted to fix this, and I think it would be nice to thin it a little bit, we don't need all of those notes, there's a very simple way. Instead of restriking the D on beat three, we can have the D as a whole note to last the entire measure. And then, as you can see in orange down here with my yellow highlight, you can have the B flat half note go to another B flat half note below. And we don't need the G in the thumb of the left hand because the G is sounding in the right hand. That will clear things up here. It'll also get rid of that parallel fit, parallel octave. So the current way, it sounds like this. So we're getting parallel octave. Now, like I said, the inversion of this chord kind of hides that parallel. So we're sort of getting away with it already. But if you wanted to tidy it up, this would be a way to do it. So take out the G from the left hand. And we've got it decluttered. There's a little uh, thing in the next measure as well. The 
recommendation I would have, and again, this is totally subjective. You may disagree a thousand percent, but I don't think we need all of that motion in the left hand. I think it's actually a little bit confusing. I like having one, two, three, four, and one, especially as I mentioned in technique one, how we have that difference in rhythm there, that book ended rhythm. But I think the D in the right hand is getting in the way a little bit. I think we really want to hear a one, six, four here. But I like the B flat idea. I think the B flat idea, see, you can see in the chord changes up above. I think that's a cool idea. The problem is there's no B flats in the piano part. There's a C, an F, a D, and an A. That's a D minor seven chord, not a B flat major seven chord. So uh, what's really happening in this measure with the harmony is we're kind of doing a little bit of a mashup chord change, which is cool. I love mashup chord changes. I just think it might be one or two degrees into the clutter zone. And if, if you wanted to, t to declutter a little bit, my recommendation would be get rid of these notes in the left hand, just go C quarter note, B flat dotted half. That way we get that B flat C connection and take the D out and use the A and the F in the right hand. So what we currently have is, and I'm recommending, It's, um, again, very small thing, but it, it just cleans it out slightly without losing those harmonies. And in fact, I think it enhances the harmony on the first half of the measure. So that would be my recommendation there. So what's my opinion of this hymn? I think it's a lovely little tune. I, I really love how it teaches the children how we can use the power of music when we're struggling and need a little help from heaven. That is such a worthwhile and effective way of helping our children come closer to the Savior. So I'm all for it. I'm not sure it's going to be a big monumental blockbuster, but I think it's a beautiful tune and a nice addition to our hymnal. If you'd like to download the complete harmonic analysis I've done of this song, uh, I've dropped a link down in the description box below. It's free, no strings attached. And be sure to hit the subscribe button and click the bell so you get notified each time I post a video. In our next uh, video in the series of new LDS hymnal reviews, we'll look at hymn number 1007, As Bread is Broken, which is a more traditional hymn-like piece. I'll see you then.